take our place on that cross, for taking what we deserve. We just, we lay everything at your feet with thankfulness and gratefulness, Father, and um, we just love you, and uh, we lift your name up and pray that everything that we say, everything that we do, our actions may glorify you as, as we're here today and as we walk out the rest of the week, and I pray this in your name, amen. Before you take a seat, let's welcome each other, say good morning, give each other a high five. Well, good morning to you. It's honestly, you, you see me come up here every week. I do the same thing every time. And it's the same one person who responds, and it's wonderful. One, it's, maybe we're tired of it, Jason says. Welcome to Crossridge. <laughs> if you are new with us today, I'm sorry. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just glad that you're with us uh, on this beautiful summer hot weekend where we get to enjoy God's creation outside. Um, each week we spend some time uh, praying for some different things that are going on in and around Crossridge. And this week we actually have some, uh, some old friends with us who have spent the last four years in Mongolia. Chris and Wanda Collins, many of you would remember them, uh, have been there, like I just said, for four years with their family, uh, serving in a number of capacities there. Uh, I want to invite Chris up to just share a little bit about the time that they've uh, been spending there, um, what it is that they're doing, and how we as a church and as individuals can be praying for them as they're heading back in the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, so Chris, take it over. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. So as you've probably figured out, yes, I'm Chris. Many of you know me. <laughs> it is a still morning, right? Oh, good, good, okay. Uh, so yes, as you can see, uh, there we are in Mongolia, and uh, my family's in the back there as well, but you can't really see them too well right now. And uh, I just want to talk to you very briefly today a little bit about Mongolia to kind of introduce it and then also why it is that we are there. Um, so first of all, many people don't really know where Mongolia is, so let me just show you this on Google Maps. Uh, so Mongolia is right there with Russia to the north and China to the south, uh, which creates some very interesting situations. 
And uh, it's, it's a fairly large territory, but there's only 3.4 million people who live there. Just over 3 million people. It's a very small population. Um, but when people think about Mongolia, they typically imagine horses uh, and open fields. And if you've seen the documentary, the eagle hunters and camels, the Gobi Desert, of course, and one more, tents. And all of this is real. People really do live in tents there. Uh, the horses are there, the camels are there. There are also eagle hunters, but nowhere near where we live. And uh, so this is all real, but where we live is not in a place like this. Um, and so I want to show you a picture of where it is that we do live. It's this city. Uh, this is the capital city of Mongolia, and it's said Ulaanbaatar, but even the Mongols just call it UB because it's too long for them as well. So you can just call it UB, okay? Uh, so UB, actually half of the population lives there. It's 1.7 million people, and that's one of the reasons why we live there. Um, but there are some things about this city that make it fairly famous in the world. Uh, the first one is that it is the world's coldest capital city. Not really the co coldest city in the world, but we get to say capital, right? So it's the coldest capital city. Uh, sometimes it gets down to as cold as minus 40, uh, with wind chill can get down to minus 50s, 56 or something like this, I once saw. Um, and so it's very cold. But uh, it also has the shame of being known as the world's most polluted city. And this is connected to the cold, actually. Um, it's only the, cold, the most polluted city during the winter months. And so this is because uh, people have to burn massive amounts of coal as families in order to survive the frigid winters, just to stay warm every single day. And that means that in the spring, it can look like this, which is kind of nice, right? It's kind of pretty. Uh, but in the winter, it looks like this. Yes, this is from our window, by the way. The window was not open, I promise you. Yeah, but uh, so it's very, very bad. And um, one of the problems with this is that in the capital city only, in, compared to the rest of the country, um, the, I think the second leading cause for children under the age of five of, of death for children is um, pneumonia. And it's directly related to the pollution. Um, and so it's a very serious issue. Um, so you might wonder to yourself, why would we go and live in the middle of all of this? Um, the reason why, just very briefly, I want to show you some statistics. Um, this is coming from a book that was published by the Mongolian Evangelical uh, Alliance, and they produced this in 2020. So these statistics are, they were conducted, it was a study in 2020 for the state of the Mongolian church. And I want to highlight just one thing in particular there. This is the number of church attending believers, uh, 32,836 which actually it's a little bit under 1% of the pop total population of the country. Uh, what you have to understand is that Mongolia, up until the year 1990, was a communist country. Uh, it was the second country to become communist after Russia. And so uh, for much of that period of time, of course, Christianity was forbidden. And therefore, the church today is very, very young. It's only about 30 years old. And so, yes, there's only this number of Christians which is something to celebrate because in 30 years, this is how many people have believed in Christ. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also kind of a sit, sort of a sign of how dire the spiritual situation is. And I'll show you one more slide here. Uh, this is a picture of Mongolia. And the green shaded areas are the places where there are churches. So then the white is where there are no churches at all. And this is even kind of deceptive because in the green areas, some of these only have one church or two or three. And even in those churches, there are no pastors. They have to travel from other areas to go down there on a rotating basis. Um, so the situation is actually quite serious there. And that really is why we are there. We want to help with planting churches. Uh, we want to help produce literature because it's such a young church. There's not a lot of materials that are there for them. Uh, and we just want to be there to help reach the lost. So we are, we are involved in that. And uh, that's it in a nutshell. I just want to say thank you to you, though, because over the last four years that we were there, uh, you guys have been supporting us. We know that you've been praying for us, and you as a church have also been supporting us financially. So I want to say thank you to you. It really means a lot to us. Thank you so much. And I had asked uh, 
Chris, oh my goodness, I'm blanking there for a second. I'd ask Chris how we can be praying uh, for these guys uh, just as a church and as individuals as we go from here. Um, you guys are returning to Mongolia when? August 21st, so it's coming back uh, really quickly. Um, the children that are part of this family, uh, when they left to go to Mongolia, they were two and four, and they are now eight and six. And that is, that's a lot of time to have been away from a place and then to come here and to have to transition back, getting back into schooling and all of the things that are involved there. So we want to be praying for a smooth transition for you guys, a safe transition as you do that, and also just for just joy and that you guys get to see fruit uh, of all the work that you're, you're serving in there. So I'm going to pray, and then uh, Sam's going to come and open God's word this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you again for the fact that you, uh, you have called uh, Chris and Wanda uh, to go as a, as a family, even as their, their kids are there, they're a part of this. Um, you have given us a mandate to, to love you and to show others who you are. And I pray that as they go, uh, as they return, that transitions would be smooth, that all the things to deal with, with immigration and travel and those things, God, that you would just have your hand in that um, as they even just socially transition back into friend groups and all the different things that are involved in that. We pray for, for peace. Uh, we pray for the kids and for their peace as well and their ability to trust you. Pray that you would increase that. And also, God, that you would, uh, you would give them joy as they serve and that there would be fruit that they would get a chance to see and celebrate in your goodness and faithfulness. So we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And they'll be sticking around afterwards. Please stop by, say hello, and uh, ask them some questions about Mongolia. Sorry, it's stuff like that why Andy's firing me. Yeah, baby. All right, Galatians chapter 4, guys. We're moving along in our study of Galatians verse by verse. And so we're at chapter 4 and verse 21 uh, today. We're going to hit the last little bit of uh, chapter 4. And what's been happening is Paul has been writing to this new church, this young church in Galatia. And it's made up of uh, Jews and Gentiles, people who are traditionally Jewish and religious, people who are following a pantheon of Greek pagan religions, and they have all come to know Jesus. They've met the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ and believed in him. They've had their lives transformed. They've discovered the grace of the gospel, grace that their religion could never do for them, the gift of God, of life and salvation and flourishing, and they're walking in that. And what Paul has been doing is he's been writing to this church, to these people transformed by grace, and he's been saying, guys, do not for the life of you, let false teachers and legalists creep into the church and pull you away from that grace and that freedom that you have found in Jesus. Do not let these people come in and make your Christianity into a moralistic, jumping through hoops sort of religion where you have to perform for God and if you perform well enough, then he will love you, then he will accept you. That is not the gospel you've heard. That's not grace and there's only slavery in that. Whereas the gospel of grace has given you freedom. Keep walking in that freedom. Don't let the legalists, don't let the false teachers pull you into a life of moralistic performance. And Paul's going to finish up that argument in chapter 4. And he's going to do that by giving us uh, an allegory and an image, a story from way back in Genesis in the Old Testament. And it's going to be awesome. So let's read the story together starting at verse 21. Paul says, tell me. You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband." 
Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is a little bit of a confusing passage. If that frightened you, don't worry. It will make sense. And Paul actually has a really powerful, really important point to make. But if you take away nothing else, Paul is trying to hammer into our hearts and our minds that there are different ways that we can relate to God, the ways that we can see our relationship with God and how we see that relationship with God is supremely important because it will affect everything else about our heart, our mind, and the way that we live and structure our lives. That will come down to how we see our relationship with God. And Paul has been trying this whole time and he's trying to hammer home to us in this passage. Do not see yourself in relation to God as a slave. Do not see this relationship as one based purely off of servanthood and slavery. See yourself in relation to God as a child of God, a son, a daughter of God, because that's going to change everything about your life. So let's just walk through it. Uh, Starting at verse 21, Paul said, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? What's he talking about? Whenever the New Testament talks about the law, it's primarily talking about either the Ten Commandments that Moses got on Mount Sinai that God gave to him to write down on tablets of stone. It's kind of the moralistic commands that God gives to Moses to give to the people. Okay, it's that. That's the law. And it's also... Uh, when the New Testament talks about it, it's also the first five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch. It's the books that Moses wrote. That's called the law. And so when Paul's talking about it here, he's saying, you who desire to be under the law. So you who desire to live your lives by the law, by the book. But Paul's not just talking about people who desire to live their lives in accordance with the word of God, because that's actually a good thing. Paul's talking about something else. But we need to think about what our relationship is to the law to the word of God, because we as Christians are called to be people who live our lives according to this, to see this as something that is beautiful, that is a gift from God. We see this as inspired by God himself, and that it's good for equipping us for everything that we need for life and for godliness. It's through this that we actually encounter the presence of God and hear the voice of God. He speaks to us. He meets with us through this. And it's through this that he actually shapes our heart and our mind to become more like Jesus. It's not just an instruction book. It's not just a book of laws. It's where we meet with God. And I want to just start by saying there are two, I think, big ways that Paul would have us notice that we can live by the law. So the first one is how we're supposed to live, which is what the psalmist in Psalm chapter 1 outlines for us. He writes this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. This is the first approach to the law, the word of God, the commands of God that we're supposed to take. It's one of joy. Did you catch that? Oh, the joys of those who meditate day and night on the word of the Lord like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. This is the the approach we're supposed to take to the word of God. It's joy, and it is above all relational, and it has its foundation in a joy-filled trust of God because God is God, and he loves me, and he's given me this, and through this, through the the voice of his spirit and the words that he's given us, this is how he's going to lead me in the right paths of life. He's trying to help me avoid danger and avoid harm and actually walk the paths of life that I'm supposed to walk and to flourish like a tree planted by water, bearing fruit in every season. It's this relationship with the word of God where we get to know God better and we trust God more and more and we love him more and more and we actually trust that he actually has my best, my good in mind when he calls me to follow this. And so we walk in the paths of righteousness through this. It's kind of like this. Uh, I grew up in Edmonton, uh, which actually I think that slide was wrong. I think Edmonton's the coldest city in the world. That's how it feels anyway. Um, 
but I grew up by the river valley, and so I had this dog. His name was Spud, all right? And Spud was a uh, yellow lab crossed with a husky, and he was adorable, and we were best friends, and he was also dumb as a post, all right? And so I would walk Spud down by the river valley, and it was beautiful. There's these awesome paths that wind through this big majestic forest, and it would lead us out into this clearing right along the river where the sun was shining clearly. It was beautiful. I could throw sticks, and Spud would play fetch, and we would love each other, and it was awesome, and it was like doggy heaven. But the problem was I started letting Spud go free without a leash. And so we'd go on these paths, and pretty quickly, he would smell a porcupine. You can probably see how this story ends. He would run after these porcupines. I like to think he was trying to just cuddle with them. I think he was trying to eat them because I would find Spud curled up in a ball looking like a pin cushion, just covered head to toe in porcupine quills. And this happened like five, six, seven times to the point where the vet was like, what are you doing to this dog? Like, you gotta put this guy on a leash or he's going to die. Right? And so I started putting Spud on one of those big extendable leashes, and that way he could stay close enough to me that he could hear my voice. We got to spend more time in proximity to one another, and he actually started to love it and see that as the ultimate freedom and flourishing because I could lead him down the right path that would lead us to where he ultimately wanted to go, which was for his joy and his flourishing by the river having a swim. That's what the Word of God is like, our, our relationship to the law. Spud came to trust me and love me and be close to me and trusted that I was leading him down the right path to where he wanted to go to flourish. That's what this is like. It's joy-filled trust in the Lord that he's not trying to ruin our fun or ruin our lives or take away from us anything. He's actually trying to give us the ultimate life that we ultimately deep down are desiring and the life that we are going to flourish by living by walking in the law of the Lord, by living by the law. So that's not what Paul's talking about when he condemns those who are under the law. What Paul's talking about is those legalists who want to actually make the law the ultimate thing. So those people who are coming into the church and saying it's no longer about the grace of God and the free gift of God through Jesus by which you're saved and have relationship with God. It's no longer love and trust and mutual walking together These are the guys that are saying, no, it's purely by how well you perform the standards of the law that determines whether or not God will love you, accept you, and have you in his family. And Paul is saying that is wicked, that is demonic, and that only leads to slavery because that changes Christianity, this beautiful thing that is built on relationship and love of Jesus to us mutually, and it turns it into a moralistic religious system where we just jump through hoops for God so that he'll accept us. That's not Christianity. That's not what it's ever supposed to mean or what it ever should mean. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't bring that in. Don't water down the beauty of the grace of the gospel. So he's saying, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? So he's flipping it around on them. He's saying, hey, you want to live by the word of the law? Do you even know what it says? And then he's going to give us a story from the law, from the Old Testament, that actually flips their legalism on its head and proves that uh, they're, they're only leading to slavery and not leading to life. And so he says this, for it is written, verse 22, that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So Paul is telling us an ancient story of two sons. And if you don't know the story, this comes from way back from Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. And this is the story of Abraham and Sarah. If you don't know it or you forget what happens, I'll just summarize it really quickly for you. Basically what happens, Abraham and Sarah, they're the patriarch and the matriarch of the entire Jewish people, the entire Jewish nation. So way back after Adam and Eve fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, things are chaotic. A few years after that, God visits this guy Abraham and he he makes a promise with him. And he promises that Abraham is going to come out of the land and that through Abraham's offspring, God is going to bless the entire world. He's going to make a great nation out of him. And that through his offspring, he's going to bring blessing and salvation, ultimately the Messiah, through their their lineage. And he's going to have as many children as the the, uh, grains of sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Beautiful promise. The problem is that Abraham and Sarah are old, like properly old. And like beyond childbearing years. And Sarah, up to this point, has been barren. She's been unable to have children. 
And so that becomes a major problem when God's telling them that he's going to bless the whole world through their lineage because they don't have lineage. But God promises that he's going to do it. And so a few years go by, still no baby for Abraham and Sarah. And what do they start? What do they do? They do what every single one of us does when God tells us something and we're supposed to trust him, but it's taking too long, right? We try to help God along. So we take things into our own hands and we stop trusting. That's what Abraham and Sarah did. It'd been a few years, still no baby. And so Sarah comes up with this plan and she says, Abraham, why don't you sleep with Hagar and have a baby through her? And she's the maidservant. She's a slave woman. So Abraham, why don't you have a baby through Hagar, the slave woman, and that will be our baby? Boom. We'll, fu- we'll fulfill God's promise basically without God. We'll just do it ourselves. And so Abraham, being a man who, you know, just wants to keep his wife happy, he says, okay, fine. I wonder how that conversation went, right? Like, he had to have been thinking, like, surely this is a trap, right? Like, my wife is telling me to sleep with the young slave woman. Like, I'm supposed to say no, obviously. But this was a common practice back then, and so they did it. And they had the baby Ishmael through Abraham and Hagar. They had Ishmael. That's the son of the slave woman who was born into slavery. And then there was a second son. So after a few years, after Abraham and Sarah and Hagar rushed ahead, stopped trusting God, took it into their own hands, and did it by their own human effort, God still came through on his initial promise. And a few years later, when, get this, Abraham is 100 years old, and Sarah's in her 90s. And she's well past childbearing years. She's been barren her whole life. So through a miracle of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, they have baby Isaac in their hundreds. Which as a side note, like they're still having fun in their hundreds. That's amazing. They're still making time for date night and coming together as husband and wife. We should learn from that in our old age. But God came through on his promise, right? He was good on it and eventually Along comes baby Isaac. So that's what Paul is talking about when he says, with these two sons, the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. And what is Paul trying to say here? He's going along with this theme that he's been hammering home to us this whole time so far, which is Ishmael represents human effort and striving and moralism, and Isaac represents grace, the promise and the power and the provision of God, because he's saying Ishmael was the product, the creation of Abraham and Sarah, not trusting God, but taking things into their own hands and trying to make his promises happen and their future happen by their own effort. Whereas Isaac came about purely through the grace of God, the miraculous provision of the Holy Spirit, causing that baby to be born. And the picture is law versus grace. He's still saying the same message he's been preaching this whole time. It is not by human effort like Hagar, the son of the slave, Ishmael, that you can become part of the family of God and save yourself. Do not make Christianity into this moralistic religion where you just clean yourself up on the outside by your own effort. You don't actually need God for that. You don't need Jesus for that. If all Christianity is, is just a way for us to get some moral lessons and to live better lives and be better people, that's every single man-made religion in the world. That's not Christianity, and you actually don't need the power of the Holy Spirit for that. Paul's saying, guys, that's never what this was about. Don't be Ishmael's, be Isaac's. The new birth, the new life that God promises you and calls you into is only available through his power, not your own effort. God has to do it where we simply receive what God has already done for us through Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection for us, we receive that promise through the grace of God. Not by works, but grace through the promise of God. That's the only way to become part of the family of God. Do not get it twisted. Do not pollute grace with works. So there's two sons, and then he goes on and continues with another allegory, and he tells us this. In verse 24, now this may be interpreted allegorically. Just stop right there really quickly. Allegorically. So this is where we take a story, and instead of treating it as literal and historical, um, we basically just interpret it however we want, and we glean a few little cute, um, little helpful life lessons out of it, right? Do we do that with the Old Testament? Do we have liberty to do that with the Old Testament? No. 
right? So the Old Testament, there are some wacky stories in there. Have you guys read it? There's some crazy stuff in there. But it claims to be historical. It does not claim to be just a big book of weird allegories. It claims to be historical. And we cannot just take Old Testament lessons and open it up and just do whatever we want with it because you can do that and basically end up with any sort of wacky application that you want. That's how you end up with different religions and different beliefs and different ideas about who God and Jesus are that the Bible's not actually trying to say, right? Where does this happen? David and Goliath, right? You've all heard it. Okay, this was, this was when I realized this. This is ridiculous. I was a teenager. I was playing soccer and uh, I was like the only Christian kid on my team or whatever, and my coach is trying to get us fired up because we're like last place or doing not well, and we're playing against the first place team, and we need to win. And so what does he do? He goes, Delphs, you're the Bible kid, right? This game is David and Goliath, right? David had five smooth stones to take down the giant. You're starting center midfield. Pick your five smooth stones. Whoever one of these turkeys you want to play around you in the midfield, those are your five smooth stones, and you're going to go and slay Goliath, and blah, blah, blah. And then he started swearing, and then he's like, pray for us, Delphs. I'm like, yeah, let's go, right? But that's what we do. If we're not careful, we could just take these Old Testament stories, the story of Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath, and we just twist them all up and do whatever we want with them. We don't actually have the liberty to do that. When can we interpret and apply an Old Testament story allegorically? When it says we can. And that's what Paul does. He says, this can be interpreted, this can be applied to your life in an allegorical sense. That was a side note. Okay, so what do these two women mean? This may be interpreted allegorically, verse 24. These women are, what, two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. What is Paul talking about? Okay, so two covenants. What is a covenant? A covenant is uh, this solemn promise of God where he makes himself the God of his people, and he makes those people his God. He forms this bond with them and says, I will be your people, I will look out for you, and you walk with me, and we'll have this symbiotic, beautiful relationship. I'll be your God, right? And he sets terms for the covenant. And so really in the the Bible, we have Old Testament, New Testament. That literally just means Old Covenant, New Covenant. And so the Old Covenant, thinking of the Old Testament, this came down, like I said earlier, from who? Moses at Mount Sinai when God gave him the moral commands to bring to the people. That established the law, which was the basis of the old covenant. So I kind of made a formula, but I don't actually know if it's helpful for you, if we have it on a slide. Um, We'll see. Yeah, so Hagar equals the old covenant, which is based off of the law, which Moses got from Mount Sinai. Does that make sense? right? Old covenant is based on law. God gave a bunch of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. And essentially he put the responsibility on the people, follow my ways, follow the way of the law that I gave Moses at Mount Sinai. Then you will be my people. Okay. It's based off law. And that corresponds, Paul says, with the earthly Jerusalem. So Jerusalem uh, is the city that represents the Jewish people. It's a representative city. So what Paul is saying is the current Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, the present Jerusalem is Jerusalem which is filled with Jewish people who are rejecting the grace of Jesus as the means by which we are saved and walk with God, and they are sticking to law as the basis of their relationship with God. Basically, they're rejecting the gospel of grace, and they want to keep living by law and relating to God by the law. And Paul says, ultimately, for those people who he relates to Hagar, right, because she's the slave woman who gives birth to a slave child, if you are a child of Hagar, And the old covenant, which is based in law, that only leads to slavery. That does not lead to freedom, right? But on the contrary, verse uh, 26, but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. So Paul is saying to the church, he's saying to the Christians, to the believers, we no longer are part of the Hagar old covenant based in the law and trying to be moral and good enough for God. Now it's new covenant. It's The Jerusalem above, which is Bible language for New Jerusalem, which basically means heaven. So Paul is saying, you are now citizens of heaven by grace through the life and death and resurrection and promise of Jesus. You are now part of the heavenly Jerusalem, and that leads to freedom. Does this make any sense? 
Yeah, maybe. All right. Here's the formula. Sarah equals new covenant equals the promise of God, which comes by grace, not by works, which comes through Jesus, which corresponds with the heavenly Jerusalem, which all of us who believe in Jesus, who have accepted his free gift of grace, are now citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem above, and that leads to freedom, walking in freedom, not enslaved to our own moral performance and how well we're doing, but instead relating to God by his grace, walking with him, following the way of the law, not because we have to, but now because we want to, and because we trust God that this is the way of life and flourishing. A little bit confusing. Uh, And then Paul says, verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Paul is quoting directly from Isaiah 54, verse 1. This is a prophecy that was given uh, to the people of Israel, God's people, who at that time of that prophecy, they are in Babylon, because they've been ransacked and exiled, so they are now desolate, destroyed, um, downcast, no hope for a future, because they've been ripped out of their land, and they're in a desolate captivity in Babylon. And what uh, Paul is quoting, why he's quoting this, and what Isaiah is saying to the people as God's mouthpiece is, hey, I know things look really desolate right now. You look barren, just like Sarah looked barren, It looks like you have no fruit coming out of your life because you're just squashed and and pressed down and oppressed. And it looks like all the nations around you, including Babylon, are really thriving and flourishing. And so that's causing you to despair. But listen, I'm still going to follow through on my promise. My people, I'm going to take you out of Babylonian exile. I'm going to lead you into the promised land, and I'm going to give you new life there. And actually, I'm still going to make good on my promise that I gave to Abraham and Sarah where through my people, through their line, through their lineage, I'm going to provide the Savior, the Messiah, who's going to usher in this new covenant that is by grace and by which you are going to have ultimate freedom and flourishing. You are going to have children of the desolate will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So he's saying the fruitfulness of your life, even though you can't see it right now, because God is so good, Your life is going to be fruitful. There is a hope. There is a future for you. He's going to do it. And ultimately, this is amazing. God did it. And so he brought his people out of exile, out of Babylonian captivity. And then through Abraham and Sarah, through Isaac, not through Ishmael, through Isaac. And then through Isaac's line, right, Jacob, right? And then all the way down to the house of Jesse, the King David, all the way down through the generations, all the way to a woman named Mary, the mother of Jesus who, virgin birth, gave birth to Jesus who would live perfectly for us, die in our place, and rise again to new life, ushering in this new covenant that he's talking about. So all these thousands of years, through all the desolation and all the despair and the hopelessness, God still came through on that beautiful promise. And Paul is just, he's tying this back to Sarah to say, church, Galatian church, there's people trying to influence you and point you back to legalism, point you back to the old covenant, to the law, to your own moral performance. No, remember that it's grace. Remember the history of your people because it's through the barren ones, the desolate ones, not the ones who look shiny and cleaned up and moralistic on the outside. It's actually through the ones who look desolate and barren like Sarah and like your people in, in exile in Babylon that God chooses to, to choose and to work through their lives to clean them up by his power and his goodness and his grace, not because they did anything. They were barren and desolate and had nothing to bring to the table. He's trying to just point us again to the goodness of God to take us in our sin, in our brokenness, no matter who we are, where we are, what our family history is, what our background is. He's saying it doesn't matter. You don't, it's not just the traditional people of of Judaism. It's not just the, the traditional Israelites who are the people of God, the children of Abraham. This is a spiritual birth, right? So for us, it's not just the people who come from nice, shiny, cleaned up, perfect Christian households. 
right, with perfect little shiny Christian upbringings who went to Christian school and went to youth group and did all the stuff and jumped through the hoops and went to church on Sundays and sang the songs. It's not just those people that God is going to take and use. That stuff is okay. That stuff is good. But that stuff ultimately gets us nowhere in terms of God taking us and loving us, saving us and doing something with us. It's the broken, it's the messed up, the barren, the desolate that God has this soft spot for, this heart for, that he actually historically has chosen to meet and to use and to do something amazing and create a future for. The gospel is for everyone, not just the physical children of Abraham. Now children of Abraham are all those who receive the grace by the power of Jesus. That's what Paul's trying to hammer home to us. And if I lost you in all of that, I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, If nothing else, hey, that's two mothers. We looked at two sons, two mothers. Paul's really just trying to really make it clear for us that ultimately in the end, guys, this is about two different ways that we can relate to God. Right, so look at those last few verses. Verse 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Paul's trying to say to this church, he's trying to say to us, guys, cast out the slave and the son of the slave who represent what? Legalism, who represent the law who represent moralistic religion without the heart, cast them out. We need to get those, that spirit out of our own heart, out of our own life, out of our own relationship with God, and out of the church. Because ultimately an atmosphere, an environment of law leads only to slavery and not to life. Instead, we need to foster this environment, this atmosphere of grace He's saying two ways that you can relate to God and which one you choose makes all the difference for you in a very practical way. Are you relating to God as a slave or are you relating to God as a child? Is this a relationship of slavery and master of just purely servanthood? I just need to serve God? Or is there actually a love, a joy as a child of God, a son, a daughter of God, because that's how it's supposed to be. Think about the difference between that relationship, slave and master versus child and parent, and not like a deadbeat absentee parent, a perfect parent. Think about the difference. If you're a slave, do you want to hang out with your slave master? No. As soon as you're done your work that you're obligated to do, you're out of there. You're not talking, you're not hanging out, you don't want to be in your slave master's presence, you don't want to learn from them, you don't want to hear from them. You're just there to do a job. It's a transactional relationship. I do my work. They give me this. Right? That's sometimes how we think about our relationship with God, unfortunately. I think. I do these things, and so God is obligated to give me salvation and life and blessing. Whereas God's not interested in that. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in love, in relationship. Is there any joy in it? In walking with God, if you're not a slave but a son or a daughter, what does a child want to do with a perfect parent? They want to spend time. They want to roll around on the floor and laugh and play. They want to jump up in in mom's lap or dad's lap on the couch and, and hear stories and tell jokes and watch TV and go on adventures and, and have this relationship, this bond. They want, man, when you're a kid, you think your parents are the smartest people in the world. Then you, later you find out they're not. They're broken like all of us. But you just have this trust. You have this love where you want to hear from your parents. You want to learn from them. And you actually want to become more like them. And it's fueled not by this obligation and this duty and this I have to do this. It's actually fueled by a desire, by affection, by joyful love and trust in that parent. God's like, man, that's what I want with you guys. I'm not interested in just having a bunch of slaves who feel obligated to work for me. I want you. And this plays out in so many different ways, man. Think about your disciplines. Think about your your Bible reading, your time in prayer, your time serving in the church or in the neighborhood or wherever. Man, if if all that is is just obligation, it's just like you're working for a slave master, that's not going to last. You're not going to want that. And God doesn't actually want that either. 
Is there any delight in it? Like the psalmist says, joy. Joy in the presence of God. I want to do this. Not I have to. I actually get to go to work with my dad and join him in what he's already doing. Man, this will change the way that you relate to to God in terms of your sin. When you deal with sin, right? Because if you're a slave, if you mess up the job, if if you just royally mess it up and you make a mess of things, you're afraid, right? You're afraid to tell your slave master and you think to yourself, I need to fix this up before I go to the slave master or I'm gonna be in big trouble. I need to fix it up in my own effort. Right, but that's not how a father and son operate. Right, a few years ago, I, um, I totally demolished my, my Honda Civic. I totaled it, wrote it off. I was shoulder checking. I wasn't texting, don't worry. But I was shoulder checking and I didn't notice that this massive truck in front of me had just screeched to a halt. And by the time I looked back, I was full speed into the back of this truck and just demolished it, smashed it up, windshield smashed. I was all bent up like a pretzel, just a mess. And I was on my way to work and I got out of the car and I was just terrified, right? I was like, and so the first thing I did was call my dad, but I was so scared. And I just immediately, he answers the phone and I go, dad, I screwed up so bad. I dropped the ball. You gave me this car as a gift. I smashed it. I totaled it. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'll, don't worry, I'll make it right, I'll make it right, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll take my car to a, a mechanic or whatever, I'll, I'll fix it, that was such a lie, I can't fix cars, but I was like, I'll fix it, dad, I'll do it, I'll pay for it, I'll do this, and I'll, I'll, I'll call a taxi to go to work, and I'll do all this stuff, and he's like, hey, shut up, <laughs> relax, hey, are you okay, I'm coming to meet you right now, just stay where you are, don't worry about the car, don't worry about the money, don't worry about getting to work, Okay, I'll take care of it. Just stay where you are. I just want to know that you're safe. And he came and he took care of this and he fixed me up and he took me to work. I don't know why I didn't go to the hospital. (laughs) I went to work as a personal trainer and trained people the rest of the day. Anyways, and he took me to work and he took care of the car and he insisted on paying for it. And And I'm just like, oh man, that's the difference between a slave master relationship and a a child and a, a parent relationship. So when I fall into sin and I mess it up and I drop the ball, if I'm just looking at God as a slave and a judge who's going to bang the gavel and bring the weight down on me, of course I'm not going to come to him. But if I know that he's a loving father who just cares for me and he doesn't take sin lightly, that's not what I'm saying. It's serious, but that he's going to meet me in it with grace and say, son, you can't fix it up yourself. You're not able but I want to fix you up. Come to me. My burden is light, okay? It's easy. Come to me. Let me take this weight off your shoulders. Let me move you toward healing and life. That's the difference. Are you looking at God as a slave master or are you looking at him as a father? And then lastly, this is going to affect big time the, the, the atmosphere that we create for people. The atmosphere that you create in your home, with your parenting, with your spouse, with your work relationships, with your team, whoever you rub shoulders with, do you create an atmosphere of law or of grace? Because an atmosphere of law, it only breeds slavery, where people are afraid to bring their sin and their struggles and their doubts and everything else out into the light. They're afraid to do that because they're afraid of what the reaction is going to be. And so that doesn't actually help anything to just clamp down in legalism and go, nope, it's law, it's law, it's law, you're falling short, you're falling short, you're falling short. That doesn't help because then when we do fall short, we're afraid to bring it out and talk about it and get help for it. And so it only breeds this this spread of disease and, and it just kills us, chokes us out. But if it's father, son, if it's child and parent, right, if it's grace, Do the people in your life know that they can bring this stuff to you, the difficult things, the doubts, the sin, the struggles that they have, that they can bring it to you and you're gonna meet it, again, not with overly softness and just making light of sin because that's not love either, but do they know that you're gonna meet it with grace, with gospel, that you're gonna gospel them and go, hey, yeah, this thing that you're in, it's serious, we need to take care of it, but listen, I don't condemn you and judge you, neither does Jesus, this is what he says about this thing, let's journey and walk and work together to move you the next step forward into healing. That's the difference between grace 
and law. That's what Paul, that's what Jesus is calling us to because in law, there's no life. There's only slavery. Are you creating atmospheres, environments of law or of grace? Paul says to this church, cast out the slave and the son of the slave. There's only room in here for grace. And that's why we say often in this church, man, we're not a country club. We're not just a space for comfortable Christians to just kick their feet up and just have a bunch of nice little churchy programs and just do their thing, right? We're more of a hospital. We're broken, hurting, dying people, wounded people come to find the healing that they can only find in Jesus, And to be met with grace in the midst of their doubt and sin and any struggle, whether in their marriage or their personal life or their work or whatever that they're dealing with, we meet it with grace here and we point them to Jesus and we journey and we walk with them. We don't slam the gavel down in legalism. There's only room for grace. Jesus is calling us into freedom. And so as we move into now a time of communion, we're celebrating and we're remembering and we're participating in what Jesus has done for us, this promise that God delivered on, that he would send his own son to live perfectly the life that we could not live, to die and be crucified on the cross in our place, to pour out his blood and have his body ripped to shreds, to do what we could not in our own striving and human effort do, which is be made right with God, to be forgiven and given a new heart, and given a new life. And so if you believe that this morning, then come and take the bread and the juice, and we're gonna sing together. Come and take it, sit back down, and then we'll take it together after the first song. But man, no matter where you're at this morning, I just wanna urge you to think about, just reflect on, maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you haven't put your faith in Jesus. He's calling you into freedom. Maybe you felt the weight that moralism puts on your shoulders and you're feeling that you're trying to be a good person without God and it's not getting you anywhere. This is the difference. Jesus is calling you into grace to stop running and trying to be good enough and to just let him be good for you and receive what he's done for you. That's the invitation this morning and you will find that weight lifted off your shoulders. You'll find freedom. You'll find life in Jesus and start this beautiful love relationship where you grow more to love Jesus. You grow more like him every day and there's grace. There's grace every step of the way for your failings. Maybe you've been a Christian a long time and you have fallen back into these patterns and maybe these ways of thinking that are legalistic, that are law-based and not grace-based. Maybe you've been looking at God not as a loving father who wants to walk with you, but as a slave master that you just need to work for. Oh, I have to read my Bible. I have to pray. I have to serve. He doesn't want that. And this morning, he's calling you back into a sonship relationship, out of slavery into freedom. And so let's celebrate that, let's sing, let's praise God from the deepest part of our heart for that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are, thank you for what you've done. And I just pray right now, Lord, that you would break down, even in this place, walls of legalism, of law, of wrongful views of our relationship with you that are based solely on obligation and not on love, Lord, and that you would change our hearts that you'd fill us with a new love, a new zeal, a new fire, and a new passion to walk with you, serve you, Lord, to come clean about our sin with you and to find healing that is only in you, Lord Jesus. So would you speak to our hearts now? Would you be with us present in this place as we sing, as we worship together, as your people, as we celebrate the sacrifice that you made for us? We thank you with all our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, had his body broken on the cross for you, let's take that bread together. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you believe that, let's take that cup together. Lord, we cannot thank you enough that you gave it all for us so that we would know you, so that we would walk with you, so that we would serve you and live life to the fullest with you with full hearts. Thank you that you called us out of slavery and into life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's keep singing together.
Well, just before we go, there's just a couple of quick announcements to let you know about. It'll be real fast. First is that we have park play dates happening. Moms, get your kids out. Head over to crossridge.church slash play dates. You can find out where, what park, what time those things are happening. Great chance for you to connect over the summer. Uh, with kids ministry being on hiatus right now, this is just, this is an awesome time to be able to do that. I want to encourage you to that end. Second announcement is we're still in need, I think we announced this last week, of some ushers for this gathering. If you have a face and you have a hand and can speak to a human being with a smile, that's the caveat. Uh, we would love to get you plugged in. If you're not serving, this is a great way to actually get to know the people who you go to church with, who you are part of this body with, and that's an important thing. So you can head over to crossridge.church slash serve for sign-up information. I have one verse to read as we go out of here after a message like that, and Sam gets to preach on this next week. Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So go out with that encouragement and that reminder. We'll see you again next time.